almost there. Okay, and we are live. Good evening, web shadowers. Thank you all for joining our session today. We have the pleasure of once again hosting Dr. Anupam Mittal, who will be presenting on family medicine. As always, please remember the Google form will be posted in the chat box at the very end of the session. And with that being said, Dr. Mittal, you can get started whenever you're ready. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me back and thanks to our hosts once again for having me. Um, let me see if we can share my screen. Here we go. Okay, here we go. And this one's gonna be a little bit different. Um, as I did before, I'm gonna actually have the live chat up on my phone. So I'll try and answer some of these questions as I go along as well. So this topic is going to be a little different. I know we've done a lot of cases and, you know, with every specialist and every physician that you've seen, we've been doing cases. This one's a little different. This one's on a topic called social determinants of health. Um, it's going to be some like, it's more like public health. They're going to get some statistics in there. Um, obviously, this is a, as you're going to see, especially with the upcoming um, slides, it's a, it's a huge topic. Absolutely. So much to encompass and we won't even hit the, you know, scratch the surface. Um, with this lecture, but it's just to get you an introduction into what is a very important topic in the world of medicine that no matter what field you go into, whether it's primary care, surgery, cardiology, whatever, uh, if you're a physician, PA, nurse, whatever, you're going to experience this um, at some level. So let's see if we can jump into it then. Um, just a little bit about me. As I said before in previous lectures, I went to school, um, college at University of California, Irvine in Southern California. Uh, my bi major was biology. I went straight into med school after graduating college at Turo University um, up in Northern California. Did my family medicine residency at one of the Baylor Scott and White programs in Austin, Texas. And I currently work at Kaiser Permanente in, um, in Southern California. Just some disclosures um, to go over. Uh, these cases are examples only. There's no real patient information here. And I'm not really doing as many cases um, per se in this one, but I'm just trying to educate everyone here. It doesn't reflect any official positions. I don't have any incentives um, for this lecture. Some so objectives. What are social determinants of health? How to evaluate for social determinants of health, determinants of health in various scenarios? How to communicate with patients about social determinants of health and how to fix problems. Those are just some of the topics I'm going to touch on um, a little bit during this. Um, so I want to jump in and just kind of give a basic update into, you know, what are the main six categories that we determine our social determinants health, and then we'll break down each one and see, you know, what some are, some of the details are about each one. So number one, the first category, economic stability, things that we talked again, I'll break this out into more detail a little bit later, um, things like employment, income, expenses, debt, medical bills, support, all fit under the category of economic stability. Healthcare, so health coverage, provider availability, access is another term for that, uh, provider linguistics and cultural competency and quality of care. Again, all fit under the category of healthcare. Um, education, literacy, language, early childhood education, vocational training, higher education. Number four, neighborhood and physical environment, housing, transportation, safety, parks, playground walkability, zip code and geography, that's a big one as well. Um, social and community context, social integration, support systems, community engagement, discrimination, stress, and food, hunger, access to healthy options, et cetera. Um, you know, these are again, the very big six categories. And you look at public health departments, you know, through different governments in various parts of the world, they pretty much break down social determinants health, all essentially the same. And if these are the main categories, obviously with some variations depending on where you are. Um, you guys can look at this a little bit. I'm gonna leave it here um, so you can just browse, but we're gonna dump into each of these a little bit more. And, you know, if you wanna go back and look at the um, PowerPoint later, this will be there for you so you can look at it. Um, here's just a little chart I wanna go over, just looking at the US in general, right? I think it's pretty well known that the U.S. does pretty poorly and determine, you know, healthcare expenses and you know what we do. So let's let's look at this this figure a little bit. Um, on the left, U.S., Australia, Canada, Japan, Netherlands, U.K., etc. 
the darker uh, line represents the how, how much we spend on healthcare and what's the average life expectancy. So you can see it's very, very obvious that the United States spends more than any other country by far on their healthcare expenditures. Um, and the life expectancy is lower than any other. And in that, that in and of itself, I think this is like a year or two old, um, this chart, but you get the idea, uh, right? We do, we do pretty poor. Um, percents of GDP spent on healthcare, I and mean, we are significantly higher. We're 17.1 compared to you know tens and elevens, and even lower than that, depending on most countries. Um, public spending, how much we're spending per capita, again, is almost double what it is, say, in the UK. Um, and the amount of residents in the country covered by public spending, we're at a third um, of what, say, the UK is. So again, this is fairly not new data. We've known this for many, many, many years that the U.S. that again does just pretty poorly in terms of its uh, its healthcare and whatnot. Um, questions on any of that so far? Oh, just I mentioned before to to our host, but I'll say again, I want this to be fairly interactive. I'm only trying to monitor the chat as much as I can. Our host is going to help me do that. So please, I'm going to ask some questions throughout. If you have any questions, comments, please, um, please write them down in the comment section. I'll be monitoring. I want this to be a little more interactive than previous ones. Um, yeah, it's a pretty striking graph and we, yeah, the U.S. is pretty poorly. Um, but let's talk about each of those six categories in a little more detail with a couple of examples for some of them as well. So economic stability, right? Employment, what kind of job do they have? So when you're talking to someone and, you know, you'll, you'll, I'm sure you, now that you guys have seen so many different examples of cases in various types of specialties, and you get to understand how a physician, and again, in any scenario for every specialty is kind of approaching a patient, you know, something like a job as I haven't watched all of the specialties, but you know, what kind of job do they have makes an impact um, for primary care? Cause I'm family medicine, primary care specifically, the best example is if, you know, I'll, I'll bring about diabetes. I know that's my, that's my go-to example for most things. If someone comes in, that's having a trouble, you know, controlling their sugars, you know, what their job is and they say they have a desk job. Well, that's very different than someone who, you know, is working at Amazon and is doing all kind of manual labor and is very active. Um, so, you know, what is their job? Um, what is the income that they have associated with that? Do they have a high income? Do they not? What's their spending power? Um, where is their money going? I mean, are they a single person? Do they have, are they married? Do they have kids? Do they, you know, did they spend outside their means and buy this $3 million house that they have to pay the mortgage for? Is there someone that lives month to month and they go on these extravagant vacations every month, but they can't, you know, afford their like, monthly expenses? What are their debt? I mean, if you have a patient who's also another physician or a lawyer or someone who went to a, you know, graduate program that has a lot of debt, I mean, that plays into, you know, part of someone's economic stability. Medical bills, I mean, what is their insurance plan? I mean, is it someone who chose the, you know, got conned, not conned, quote unquote, getting the, the skinny plan is what we call it. And they, you know, if they get into a car accident, suddenly they have a, you know, $8,000 deductible. Um, you know, these insurance plans make a difference. Um, and support, who's at home? What kind of family is at home? What's their community? You know, the, the community and support system that a 40 year old has who's probably married with a kid or two is very different than potentially 85 year olds who, you know, who lives half a country away from their kids and their spouse died recently and they don't have anyone left because all their friends died too. You know, the, the support system is a very big part of that. Um, questions, how, do, how is it that we spend the most money but only for 34%? Um, and why is the U.S. spending the most of its money? Where is the money spending most of its money specifically? I mean, this, I mean, that gets into a whole separate topic, um, you know, private versus, um, you know, national healthcare systems like a lot of Europe does and Canada does versus U.S. I mean, it's just, there's a lot of variability and that's a huge topic that I want to get into specifically. You have that kind of background that if you want to research that, please go ahead and do. Um, but I mean, again, for decades, I think, We've pretty much known that the U.S. spends a lot more money in general. Um, here's a graph um, looking at unemployment rates by by you know various parts of the country. And this is again a couple of years old, back in 2017. But as you can see, you know the areas that are darker usually have higher rates of unemployment. Now contrast that, and so the, actually the big question is, uh, you know, how does that relate to health, right? So we we move that forward. So the next is. Next graph, heart disease and death rates between the ages of uh, the years of 2015 to 2017 and people 35 and older um, by county in the US. I mean, that's a pretty striking graph. I mean, that's that's pretty bad. Um, 
I mean, I can, I can turn it back and you can look at this again and, you know, see if you can find any patterns of, you know, which states, which parts of the country. I mean, generally it looks like the more Southern states have harder problems or Southern half of the country with unemployment um, and heart disease. Um, so just I flipped it back. I think the actual stream is delayed by a few seconds, but anyway, um, it's just an interesting aspect of how unemployment rates could potentially, you know, impact health. And that's a huge thing that people will get into public health sciences. I mean, we'll start looking at these trends and trying to dig into each of these communities, counties, cities, states, um, as why does these regions have such poor health outcomes and what factors in potentially each of these six areas of social determinants of health can be impacting um, impacting the, the person's health in whatever subject, whether it be cardiovascular health with heart attacks, strokes, um, diabetes, um, you know, amputations, whatever, all of the above. Um, the next one, healthcare. So as I mentioned before, healthcare coverage, you know, what's their, what's their insurance plan? Provider availability, primary care patient panel. So that one I want to harp on a little bit because again, I'm family medicine, I'm primary care. Now, you know, where I trained in, in out in residency, the average patient panel was 2000 ish, meaning so you had your primary care doctor that you all see, right? Um, that is the person that the primary care doctor that you are assigned to. How many patients does each primary care doctor have? Well, the area where I worked in residency, I think it was like 1800 to 2200, somewhere in that range. Where I'm working now, each primary care provider you know, has two and a half to 3,000 patients that each individual person comes, you know, has. And so like in my region alone, I think we have, you know, close to 300 primary care providers and each person carries two and a half to 3,000 patients. Now, imagine you send your doctor a message because you have a question about something, but every day you have 80 to a few, you know, 100, 200 people sending messages every day. You may not, like a doctor, and they have a full panel of patients that they're seeing in clinic every day, then they have to go back and answer all those questions and, you know, complaints and whatever as well. They may not get to everything. So what we call access, patients feeling that if they have access to their primary care doctor and getting care in, in an appropriate amount of time, that's a big problem, uh, this provider availability thing. Um, transportation, you know, how far do you live away from where your primary care doctor is or your, your clinic is or your nearest hospital is and you have an ability to get to where you are? Um provider linguistic and cultural competency. Um, you know, if you live in a place where the majority of your population speaks a different language than you, that's hard. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if any of you ever used translator services before and they're amazing. And we thank God for our translators that we have to help us, but it's tough and it's not the same as if you are able to communicate with a patient in their, you know, the same language. And then quality of care, health made metrics, racial disparities, things like that. Question, uh, do you think it's part of a doctor's job to be an activist for better health care in terms of accessibility, lower costs and other things that affect health? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm gonna get into that a little bit later. Um, and, you know, just again, I'm sure that question applies to just social, social determinants of health in general and yes and no. Um, and I'll explain that in a little bit um, as well. Do food desert areas have negative impact on patients' health too? Off the record, yes. Um, let's see, this is a little graph we have for, you know, access. And again, you can go back and look at these, um, this PowerPoint a little bit later and pause and, you know, break down each of these for yourselves, but, you know, approachability, acceptability, um, availability and accommodation, affordability and ability to pay, seek, et cetera. So like an example of acceptability, right? I mean, you know, a young male physician and I have a patient that comes to me who's, you know, a teen girl that says, oh, I, you know, I need to get, you know, tested for STD or I think I have an STD, you know, is that patient going to feel accepted? You know, it, it, are they sensing any judgment from me? Um, you know, approachability, do I come across as intimidating or friendly? Am I approachable as a physician? Availability and accommodation, I mean, is your system and your clinic and your specialty accommodating for patients for work schedules and things like that? So for example, where I do, where I work, we have after hours clinics. So most people work from eight to five, which is when we work was from eight to five. Uh, and so sometimes they can't get to doctor's appointments until after work. And so do you provide an option to accommodate work schedules? Um, you know, living environment, transportation, mobility, social supports for ability to reach. I mean, again, are, is a patient able to get to a place where they can actually have in-person visits? Obviously with COVID things have changed and we're doing a lot more telephone video, um, you know, 
uh, virtual visits type thing. So that's changed a little bit, but the, the, the principle still stays the same. Um, let's see, 2000 patients per doctor. That sounds like a problem. Yeah, it is a problem. It, it's, it's hard um, for, for on the physician side and the patient side. It absolutely is. Um, should we, should we prepare more health? Should we prepare for more health problems, but less patients? I imagine there's so much stress, but how would that factor into losing jobs? That's a huge problem right now. Um, people being so scared about, you know, COVID that they can't, you know, they feel so stressed that they can't even do their job and they need, you know, access to mental health and, you know, treatment to be able to function at work, you know, regardless if they have COVID or not, that's, that's a big issue. Um, would you say because the U.S. has a big emphasis on capitalism is the reason why we're leading to high rates of death, or disease, or obesity compared to other countries? Yes and no. I mean, no, nothing's going to be a straight yes or a straight no. Um, it's complicated. We're a really large country. I mean, the U.S. is bigger than, you know, all of Europe. You know, you take every single individual country, little country in Europe. I mean, it's a lot easier to manage a small country than it is to manage a massive system country like, you know, the United States. So it's, it's complicated. Um, so probably part of it. Yeah. Um, have any of the main six categories been dramatically affected by the pandemic? Um, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we'll, we'll dig into it a little bit more as we go through each individual, each individually. Um, do you think there's a shortage of doctors in the U.S. today? 100% that without question there is. Uh, you know, it's harder and harder to get into medical school. There's so many medical schools that you even have, even for excluding, let just even exclude foreign graduate, domestic graduates. You don't even have enough spaces in all of residency programs to accommodate all the domestic graduates. Um, you know, and, you know, someone may not want to live in the middle of, you know, the country where they didn't grow up if they grew up on one of the coasts. So even if there is space for someone to get a job there, they don't want to go there. So yeah, the, the amount of doctors per patient load needed is severely underrepresented. It's a, it's definitely a, a problem. Education, base education level. I mean, that's, I mean, that speaks to in and of itself, right? If you have someone who graduated college and graduate school as your patient versus someone who, you know, didn't finish high school, the level of, you know, literacy and base education level they have really does impact your ability to communicate with them about their, um, their disease process. And I think it's unfair personally, again, off the record, does it, do I think it's unfair to put all of that burden on the physician? I think you rewind even before my time, 15, 20 years ago, people to say, well, that's, you know, that's on the physician to find a way in the health system to find a way to, you know, make the patient understand. And yes, that is true, but you can't place the whole burden on the physician and the healthcare system. It has to come down to the patient themselves and their ability to, you know, want to participate in their own health. Um, as well. So it, it's multifactorial as well. Language, we talked on that a little bit. Early childhood education, you know, schools, right? I mean, this is when you have community programs that target schools and you know, look into, um, you know, educating children about their own health and healthy eating and looking at, you know, the food that schools provide in their um, for, for children at lunchtime, um, after school activities, classes, uh, sports programs, etc vocational training, higher education, it all, you know, it all speaks to itself, it all pretty similar um, as well. Why do they keep making it more difficult to become a doctor if there's more doctors, if there's a doctor shortage? That's a really good question. Um, I volunteer in wards seven and eight in Washington, D.C., and the problems in those communities we're facing have been greatly exacerbated by the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the same everywhere, and especially in more urban areas, it's, it's, it's very tough. Do you agree with nurses working as a PC, PCP? I'm not unopposed to it. I think everyone has to work within the realm of what they feel comfortable in their training on. Like it or not, as someone who goes through medical school and residency and maybe fellowship has a lot more hours and base medical, uh, what I would call it, what's the word, um, book work training than an NP or PA does. I mean, that's, that's just what it is, we do. Uh, physicians get more training that we have significantly more hours, you know, but we all have our comfort levels. For example, nurses predominantly do wound care. How much do I as a primary care doctor know about wound care? Very little. And whatever I do know, how much of it do I have actually practiced in person as opposed to, you know, in theory, very little, as opposed to a nurse who becomes an MP who's been doing that for 15, 20 years. She knows a lot more than me. So we, can she function as a you know, the primary person in a 
clinic or a system, you know, for a department in wound care. Yeah, she can do that a lot better than I can. Um, or he or she, you know, so it's all about what we feel comfortable in. And I think everyone, you know, physicians, nurses, PAs, everyone needs to get rid of the chip on their shoulders and say, you know, I feel comfortable handling this so I can do it. So let me do it. Or I don't know this and it's okay that I don't know or feel comfortable in certain area or specialty or disease process and I need help. And I should, you know, hand this off to someone who's a little more qualified than me or better suited to treat this. So I'm not unopposed to anyone doing anything as long as, you know, it's all about your comfort level and being professional and taking care of the patient. Um, you know, it, it's, it's complicated, but no, I'm not super unopposed. Um, what are possible areas of improvement in order to matriculate more people into programs, um, increasing the amount of our medical schools, which is already happening, increasing the number of residency spots, um, et cetera. Um, you think it's feasible, beneficial for patients to pay out of pocket versus high deductible plans for primary care treatments for chronic conditions. Yeah, that's getting into details about, you know, insurance stuff that is outside my realm of knowledge, to be honest. Um, do you think having a longer school route is a factor for a doctor shortage? Yeah, I think that's a deterrent for some people. A lot of people, especially more in our millennial and Gen Z generation, people say, I don't want to spend 10 plus years in school or in training. Um, I could go into PA school in a shorter amount of time and be done and willing to practice. So yeah, absolutely. That's part of it, I'm sure. Uh, can you specialize in preventative medicine after medical school or do a fellowship? I'm sure there is. I know you have community medicine fellows, fellowships after family medicine specifically um, that you can do. But I think I think generally a lot of people who get into it just have an interest in it and they just find themselves, you know, going into positions or taking on responsibilities that let them, um, you know, do this job that they're interested in. Um, let's see. Medicaid is an issue. I mean, every everything's an issue. Um, money is a big issue with patients when it comes to healthcare. Are there actually any pro bonus to help from physicians? Yeah, there are, there are um, like programs, especially like, let's say take residencies, for example, there's a lot of places that you'll go for residency where they make you go to community free clinics and things like that, where you don't, you, you provide free care to people. So yeah, that, that's, that's everywhere. Um, those programs are in different places as well. Um, Deaths attributed to social factors compared to causes of death. I mean, this is a few years old, but again, the, the basic idea is that, you know, deaths compared to low education uh, and low social support, racial segregation, income inequality, et cetera, you know, can be attributable or can be comparable to different health processes like strokes, heart attacks, cancers, et cetera. I mean, that's a pretty, again, staggering, staggering graph. And I'm sure that's changed in the last decade since, you know, this, this data was pulled, but still, I mean, it gives, it gives you the basic idea that, you know, these, these things are a problem. Um, absolutely. Um, how would you say your education as a DO impacted your understanding of what a physician does and the importance of understanding social determinants of health? I don't think going through a training of a DO or MD makes a difference on your impact of social determinants of health. Um, you know, obviously they do touch on that in medical school, regardless of what route you go to, but you get more training in that just by experience when you're actually treating patients and seeing the, the issues in and of itself. And I have an example of a case later on, uh, which will highlight that for an example. Why do you think doctors get paid so much in the U.S. compared to other countries? It has to do with how insurances go. I mean, procedures in general pay a lot more than just what we call regular office visits. So that's why a lot of, you'll see a lot of specialists, surgeons and things like that make a lot of money compared to like, say, a pediatrician who's you know, usually what we call traditionally the lowest paid person, because most kids don't require big surgeries like cardiac catheterizations and biopsies and all these things um, that adults do and us adult um, specialists do. So procedures pay a lot more and uh, again, private insurances and private companies and what we call RVU, uh, relative value use units um, uh, system pay. So that has to be with part of it is procedures based. Um, for IM, ER, can doctors practice in two different settings after residency? Um, for internal medicine, emergency medicine, residency, nurse practice, I mean, you're kind of stuck in the, the system that you go to, it's a medical specialty. So family medicine, for example, you can practice in the hospital, emergency room, urgent care clinic. Um, in the ER docs, not going to be practicing in a clinic or the hospital. They're going to be practicing in pretty much just an ER for the most part. Um, I know in India, it's a shorter route to become a doctor. Why is it different for the doctor in the U.S.? It's just different. I mean, you say, but a lot, most countries outside the U.S., you don't, college isn't a thing. College doesn't exist. You go straight from high school into a graduate school of your specialty of your choosing. But like, say, 
you know, England, for example, even though they do that, their path in the actual medical pathway is longer. So oftentimes, depending on the specialty, you'll finish before them in the United States than you will in Europe, even though they don't even have college. So it just depends on the health system. It's different. Um, are you pro or con the Medicare for all elective 2019? Not going to get into politics. Um, what does acute MI mean? MI stands for myocardial infarction. It's a heart attack. Um, can you talk more about burnout and impact of it on various levels of experience in different fields? I'll get into that a little bit um, later. Um, questions, I'm answering them as we go along. Um, neighborhood and physical environment. So housing, single family home, you know, do they have a traditional standalone home with a garden and, you know, there's no shared walls versus an apartment renting number of people in the house. I mean, that's, you know, I have some, you know, know some people who were in New York during the height of the pandemic in March and April and talking to one of my friends, they were saying that, you know, in New York, you have these apartments where you have like eight, nine family members in a tiny little apartment. And that's just this type of living that happens in these big cities, especially New York. And that was a big probable reason why New York got hit so hard compared to other places in the country. So, you know, number of people in a household is a, is a big thing. Transportation, do, do, you know, does it, your patient not being able to afford a car and they take the bus to work every day versus be on their own car. Safety in their neighborhood, again, I don't you know that I even need to explain that. I mean, is your neighborhood safe or not? How does that, and how does that play into someone's health? Um, you know, playgrounds, walkability, the, you know, areas accessible to necessities, um, grocery stores, you know, et cetera. Um, and same thing, chip code, geography, distance to anything that's, that's that they, they need. Um, do you think that making medicine undergraduate degree like it is in England help us get more doctor? No, not necessarily, not at all. Um, social community context, social integration, race, you know, job location, support systems I touched on a little bit um, earlier community engagement, um, discrimination, and that's a, that's a big one. So I'll touch on a little bit more, um, you know, um, implicit bias is a term you're gonna hear a lot. You know, do you have an implicit bias on someone because of their race or their gender? You know, you've heard that term, the glass ceiling, and you know, you'll see, I mean, it's medicine is unfortunately, um, a lot very male driven um it's a white man's world unfortunately that's just the way it is and it still is and it's hard for you know people of color male or female or women especially to break through into administration positions and you know unfortunately there is a lot of um discrimination you know women oh they can't do this because they have to take on maternity leave you know and they can't do their job or see their patients for you know x amount of weeks because they're on maternity leave and so they can't handle an admin position that nonsense gets thrown around all the time it's it's awful but it's definitely there uh, you know within the medical profession let alone you know without uh and stress i mean how you can't take into i mean you've all felt stress right you're all in college and taking tests and you know beyond and stress pays a big part and, and um in people's health, it's, it's tough. And food, I mean, that again, just how much explanation does that really need? Um, do they have access to healthy options? The near grocery store is everything around them or where they live or where they work, fast food, um, you know, it, it's, it's tough. There's a, lot, there's a lot to do with each one. Um, here's something, I didn't put any context in this. I wanna monitor the chat, I wanna give you a couple minutes and say, look at that and tell me, Anyone tell me what they think that that is representing. I'm gonna look at the chat in the meantime. What do you think would be the best way to deal with the obesity pandemic or epidemic? Yeah, epidemic. Well, it's more of a pandemic if you think about it. Um, you know, education really is a big thing. Um, healthier options, you know, educating people on what's healthy, what's not, teaching people how to read labels uh, when they go to grocery stores to know, you know, what's the healthier option, et cetera. Um, having systems in there, um, having programs in health systems to help educate people on nutrition, things like that. Um, is it better to work at a separate practice or at a hospital? It just depends on what your practice style is and what you what you'd like. Um, so obesity, life expectancy. How can we deal with childhood obesity? That's a big problem as well. And I'll touch on that a little bit. It remind me if I don't. Um, 
everything's bigger in Texas. Yeah, that's hilarious. It's really funny because that's where I was practicing. It's um, so it's actually a really sobering statistic. Actually, this is a map of maternal mortality rates. So this is the you know the rates of people who mothers who die in pregnancy and childbirth. Um, it's awful. I mean, where this is this is very very recent data and a recent map, and you know that's that's awful. How can we be in 2020, you know, forget the pandemic, um, forget COVID. How can we be in something like this and have this be a map of our, you know, areas of maternal mortality rates? That's that's awful. I was, you know, when I was on my OB rotations in residency, we would talk to some of our physicians and they would do lecture and they would say like, you know, maternal mortality rates, especially in African-Americans and Hispanics is higher than it's ever been in recorded history, not just in this country, but anywhere. We're doing the worst that we've ever done in the history of recorded medicine for maternal mortality rates. That's awful, you know. And that gets into a whole other subject of you know OBGYN of you know why why is that? You know, a lot of that has to do with you know pre you know comor comorbid conditions of maternal um, gestational diabetes and heart disease and you know ac access to you know having OB doctors and education on their health during pregnancy and prenatal care and preconception counseling that primary care providers do as well. I mean, it's, it's, it's tough. Um, let's see. Texas is blue guys. Yeah, that's, that's funny. That's a good one. Um, I saw a video about the difference in portions, ingredients and calories of fast food chains in different countries and it's striking how bad it is within the U S yeah, it's, um, it's, it's bad. It's really bad. Um, food dynamic is so interesting and sad. Heavily populated areas have more smaller um, boat gas corner source with high cal high caloric foods. Um, rural areas of healthy foods. I mean, it's it's so it's such a huge topic, and again, with such a massive country, it's how do you even study that? And are there enough public health scientists to even get that data and figure out trends soon enough to make a difference, or can it take decades? Sometimes it does take years and years, even decades, to get the data you need to show evidence that something's causing a problem by then it's almost too late sometimes or some things have changed where it's not even relevant anymore it's 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 tough um let's see let's go to the next slide oh that was all of our six that went through all six already that was a lot faster than i thought it was going to be um so evidence that any of this actually impacts health how comes it's hard to say that there's not but if you really dig into some of the details and you look at some of the experts in the country uh, and some of the reports that they pull out, there actually is very little to no evidence that any of this actually impacts health outcomes. There's no actual facts. And you may think like, oh my God, like how is that, how is that even true? And the reality is, is um, that a lot of this stuff that we say that each individual social determinant of health impacts, you know, X, Y, Z, whatever health, disease process is, is what we call consensus based. Is you have a bunch of experts and, you know, come around and they talk about a topic and they look at some of the, whatever evidence they do or don't have, and they come up with a consensus. And a lot of these, these issues are consensus based, not fact based. But as I mentioned a little bit, you know, before and a couple times is how do you even get the evidence for this stuff? How do you even study this stuff? How do you get traditional randomized controlled studies to to figure out if this stuff does impact. It's it's tough, it's complicated. And so technically we don't have a lot of evidence that this impacts health comes. Do I personally believe that it does? Absolutely. I mean, I was listening to a podcast. Um, it was a guy, I only remember his name to be honest, but he was a podiatrist by training who pretty much just practices um, nutritional medicine, um, surprisingly. And he's in his 80s, he's an older guy. And he was saying like, He's like, I was practicing in a time where all the experts in the country thought that sugar in your diet doesn't impact diabetes. I mean, now we know, of course it does, but you know, we 50, 60 years ago, we didn't know that for sure, for sure. So, you know, take, things take time to, to prove. Um, how do we as physicians process any issues that are determined to be present? Um, you know, we talk about screening. You know, do we screen people for problems um, and difficulties they may be having in each of these categories of social determinants of health? Uh, you know, things like the USPSTF, uh, one of the major organizations that gives a lot of our guidelines for primary care, um, they actually advise against screening for social determinants of health 
for all patients. Um, how do we screen? Uh, there's a number of different tools that you can use. We've heard of the EMRs or electronic medical records. A lot of those um, systems have processes built in and screening tools built in. Um, but, you know, for a lot of things, so let's take a step back and change course a little bit. For an example, you know, they talk about screening for adolescent, um, what's an example they could use? Adolescent depression or depression in adolescence. Um, are you supposed to screen people for that? Well, in general, for like that or any other problem, you should only be screening for something if you have the tools in place to deal with any abnormal screening that you have. You know, there's no point in screening for something to an extent uh, if you can't do anything about it. So that that's part of it. Let me, there's a lot of comments coming in. Let me see if I can read some of these. Um, is it possible to start some sort of free healthcare for those who can't afford it? Like a physician, can you do this? Would you do this? I mean, of course I would. I mean, can I? I, mean, I don't know. Um, that takes some level of capita, um, you know, to build a clinic and get resources and get supplies to treat people. I mean, that's that nothing's without, you know, resources and money. So possibly, um, free healthcare. I mean, there's always things like applying for Medi-Cal, Medicare, um, depending on your health situation that can give you, you know, um, help. Um, I learned about all of us in my epidemiology class. Yeah. I mean, that, that's a really good types of classes you can take in, you know, colleges, if you have an extra time or you want to study some of this or learn about some of this, that's a, good, a cool, cool class to take. Um, let's see. How do you deal with culture variations for food? Some cultures, consuming certain types of food that may not be healthy for part of the culture. No, 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 that's, that's, a, that's a really good example. So what I will tell people is my patients specifically. So again, we go back to diabetes. If I have, if I have someone who's pre-diabetic or a well-controlled diabetic and they come into my office for a follow-up or whatever, I will tell people, even people who are just overweight that don't have diabetes and they want to talk about nutrition and diet and things like that. This is the line I always give. I say, Unless I have a severely uncontrolled diabetic, I will never tell someone, do not eat your ethnic foods. I will never say that. Um, you know, if you tell, um, you know, the Chinese person, don't eat rice. You can't eat rice anymore. You tell an Indian person, don't eat naan anymore. You tell a Mexican person, don't eat um, tortillas anymore. They're going to say, well, forget you. I'm going to do whatever I want. Like, you don't, like, why should I listen to you? You know, you can't say stuff like that. I mean, I will tell people who are having some mild uncontrol of their health, I will say, look, it's not just about cutting out things that, you know, don't, that aren't, aren't healthy. It's about portion control, about limitations and creating healthy, um, sustainable changes in your diet and your activity and your lifestyle. I mean, if I told all of you to never eat dessert ever again, and never drink soda again, never drink juice and ever again, uh, never eat bread ever again, you're going to be like, I'm not doing that. Absolutely not. Um, but, um, but you know, it's all about portion control and limiting that and saying, you know, you don't have to eat a whole plate of rice with your meat. You can eat a portion of rice with your meat. Um, so it's about educating them and again, not coming off as judgmental and, you know, take into account people's ethnic background and, you know, things like food, food's important. Um, do you know why our generation seems to get sicker as the times goes by uh, in relation to maternal mortality rates, rates of cancer, Alzheimer's? There's a lot of theories out there. I mean, diet plays a big role, processed foods, unhealthy foods, um, lack of exercise. I mean, there's there's so many theories out there. We just don't know that we have a great cookie cutter answer for that, unfortunately. But there's so many things um, that that are that are con contributory. Um, let's see here. I'm interested in med and as I want to have a job that allows me to directly meet people and help them through their health. I mean, yeah, it's cool. I mean, it's hard as an individual, as a physician to, you know, think about things on this scale. You try and do things within your patient population, within your community, um, in health systems, such as Kaiser, for example, um, there's one of the leaders in, you know, um, public health and health processes and creating opportunities um, for people to get better health and population care, all these terms that you'll hear. Um, so it is system driven as well. And, you know, there's always opportunities to get involved in that in various aspects, whether or not you're a physician. Um, let's see. Are med schools doing enough to equip their doctors to address social determinant of self-health issues in their practice? I mean, yes and no. I mean, med schools are, <laughs> there's a lot to it. I mean, you know, uh, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit as we, as we coming on, um, is this with that bullet point there, is this even our job? Um, yes and no, they do introduce you to it. And how much can you learn through, learn through books? I mean, you can, um, 
take Hurricane Katrina, for example. Um, you know, some of you may have been babies when that happened back in 2005 and, you know, back in that time. But, you know, you you look at physicians and healthcare workers who went to go volunteer and be down there. Um, and, you know, you know, we're very protected in medicine, meaning people come to us, patients come to us, they come to our clinics, they come to our hospitals. How often are we going out into the community and seeing people in their home environment and base environment? Rare, I'd say, them, but, you know, generally, no, we're not. Um, I think I may have forgotten where I was going with that point, but um, do you, uh, let me see, do we equip doctors to address it? Oh, the point was, you know, you can learn about it all you want, but I mean, if you were in the middle of Hurricane Katrina and you were, you know, volunteering down there and you saw people without their houses, without shoes, without their clothes, without power and all of that, that brings a very different understand level of understanding than reading about it in a book or hearing about it on a lecture like this. Um, so there's only so much you can do um, through books and through, through lectures. Um, do you find that docs public health training do better at dealing with these issues? Well, maybe, maybe not. Um, they, help, they probably do have a level of understanding about their community and their system and you know their region better than the average physician. So yeah, I mean, it will give them some level of understanding for sure. Um, a lot of questions about maternal mortality rates and things like that. Um, it is not a factual statement to say that a person is more likely to die because of the color of their skin. I mean, yes and no, right? I mean, there are healthcare disparities and racial disparities within healthcare. Um, and, you know, we're always trying to determine, you know, why, like say thalassemia, for example, is more predominant in, you know, various parts of people from ethnic backgrounds of various types of the world, you know, diabetes, um, inflammatory bowel disease, um, heart disease, hypertension, diabetes. I mean, people do have genetic predispositions for certain disease processes that can lead to negative health outcomes and increased mortality rates. So the color of your skin, yeah, can have an out impact on people's, um, you know, mortality rates and things like that. So it's not, so yes and no. Um, similar to the increased rates of cervical cancer, it affects women in low income neighborhoods. Yeah. I mean, low income, regardless if you're a woman or man, you know, race, whatever, low income health communities do worse when their health comes in higher in general. Um, let's say, would you say that the hygiene hypothesis, um, Oh, what would you say about it? I would say that's that's a very that's a very big theory about it, and you know, um, hard to know. I'm sure that's part of it, right? You don't. I mean, you live in a sterile environment. You don't get exposed to anything ever. How are you going to build up your immune system? Well, you're not. Um, you know, when we talk about kids in family medicine, we do pediatrics, right? Kids will bring their you know, parents will bring their kids into their pediatrician or their family medicine doc, you know, every few weeks or a couple times every three months because they're my kid's sick again, my kid's sick again, my kid's sick again. When they're in, they're in daycare, I'm like, well, we say the average kid is going to get sick 15 times a year. Why? Because they're around all the other snotty children and they're all in daycare and whatnot. And they're getting exposed to all these common viruses and colds and things like that. And that's why they get sick. They're building their immune system. You know, we don't get sick from every little virus that we come into contact with the, you know, billions of viruses that we come into contact every day because we built that immunity. So yeah, if you never get exposed to any of that, it is, you know, sterile hygiene hypothesis, then yeah, of course that's going to become an issue. So yeah, that's definitely part of it. I'm sure. Um, how much materials you learned in undergrad are, are actually in use now? Um, they are, I think I mentioned it in my last lecture. Um, it does come into process and it's not about necessarily social determinants of health, but in medicine in general, you will use the basic concepts of basic bio, GCAM, OCAM, um, you, it, anatomy, physiology, and more advanced upper level classes. You do use those basic concepts in medicine in various places all the time. So it is relevant. Um, Implicit bias training is so important. Yeah, it's very important. Um, as a physician, what would you say is the hardest part of your job when working with patients? Ooh, I'm not, I don't want to get into that too much because you'll hear my negativity come out. Um, you know, there, there's, it depends on the day, depends on the patients that come in. Um, you know, sometimes everything goes great, but if all my patients show up an hour late, well, then it puts me behind and I'm frustrated and it's, my staff is frustrated and it's hard. Um, and that can be very frustrating. Um, or I have people that are just extremely sick one day and, it just, it's hard. Um, so it just depends. Um, it really just depends. Um, everything's hard. Um, let's see. So what are some of the things that we can do to change to alleviate these social health issues? 
I'll leave that to the next generation and my generation. But yeah, there's lots of things we can do. I mean, I think we each have to find something that we're passionate about and something that uh, we care about to want to try and change. And I think oftentimes you'll you'll talk to a lot of people, people our parents' age, grandparents' age, and they'll say, you know, the things that they ended up focusing on in their career was the stuff that impacted them at some level when they were younger. And that's just something that they became passionate about, like someone that wants to become a neurosurgeon because, you know, their grandpa died of brain cancer, et cetera, you know. You know I think our personal experiences help shape us and where we want to go in our careers. Um, let's see here. Um, I'm going to get to that question about different uh, COVID or social determinants affecting different populations, especially black Americans during COVID. Um, actually, I'll just talk about it now. Um, you know, the whole, like I mentioned before, racial disparities and disparities in health uh, based off ethnic background is a thing. And we know definitively that you know, people like African Americans, Hispanics, Native Americans, they have overall in general across the country, poor chronic health management, poorer than the average white American. Um, and so, yeah, when someone gets COVID and their diabetes is out of control uh, or their hypertension is out of control or heart disease and as controlled as you know, their white counterparts, yeah, that just put them at higher risk. So I'd say that's the general, as far as we know about COVID so far, that's kind of the big thing there. Uh, do I know Dr. Mike? I follow him on Instagram. Does that count? Um, is there anything learned in MD school that isn't covered in DO school? No, they all cover the same stuff. Um, so no, no real benefit or advantage either one really has in the end. Um, how, who can help us with this? And who can help us, the physicians and the healthcare team and the patient with these issues? Well, one of the big resources is social workers and case managers. Um, you know, in traditional sense, we have more of those in the ER and urgent and in the, in the hospital, sorry. Um, and they're very good at helping us, you know, managing, getting someone's resources, getting them transportation to their clinic follow-ups, um, <coughs> getting them, um, you know, access to cheaper medications, et cetera. But we have them in the outpatient side on the clinic side as well. So that's a big resource. That's really cool. Upstream and downstream interventions. I'm going to come back to the last two bullet points in a second and go forward to this upstream and downstream effects. Well, I would say in general, um, most physicians are what we call downstream. Um, you know, you have the, um, you know, 60, you know, 50 year old hypertensive to uncontrolled diabetic female with a foot ulcer um, with no job because she lost her job recently that comes in for me for help. Well, I'm fairly downstream in the process of addressing social determinants of health um, and yeah, I will be able to mitigate that to some extent in some aspect, but again, I'm fairly downstream. And the whole idea is to create systems upstream to help prevent the patient from ever getting to that point in the first place. Um, so here's a chart you can, I don't want to get into it in detail because I want to go through some more and ask some more questions before we finish, but you can look at that a little bit later. Um, is this even our job? Well, when you get into the details of it, no, to an extent, it's not our job. As a physician, it's not my job. Um, I need to take that into account. I need to have an understanding of social determinants of health and how it affects my patients. But is my job to fix it? No. Like um, if someone comes in saying, I can't pay my bills for, you know, whatever reason, and I can't, I need you to sign this waiver form to, you know, for a payment deferral on my, um, you know, my gas bill. Yeah, I can sign that if it's medically relevant, if I deem that appropriate for that patient. And I have to understand that he's had, that patient's having that issue and how that relates to his overall health. But is it my job to fix that? No, technically, no. But I have to understand it as a healthcare provider. Um, is it even worth screening for these issues? I kind of mentioned that before, meaning like, you know, if you don't have a system or a way to help this patient, then is it even worth screening? You have to determine that per patient. Every patient's different. Um, so sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. Um, let me see. I have wait for any of these questions. Is, that, is it true that patients have to argue with administration regarding to patient about what exactly? Well, I think there's sometimes is a disconnect between frontline physicians who aren't in any level of administration and people who are in administration, whether or not they're physicians or not. Sometimes if you spend, you know, 15, 20 years, your last, you know, years of your career in administration, you don't practice medicine anymore, you, you may have a loss of understanding of what's happening with your frontline workers. So arguing, meaning, 
I have me as an administrator, administrator, I have my agenda of things I need to get done for my clinic, my hospital, my system. But what I need to get done, what I'm seeing as the problems at my level aren't necessarily the problems that my, you know, nurses, PAs, physicians are having. Um, and so if there's a disconnect and I'm not seeing that and they're having problems and they have to sit and argue with me, uh, argue, discuss um, with me about what their system, you know, problems are having. Yeah, that can create friction and problems. Uh, so it, it takes, you know, uh, um, you know, understanding on both ends and a willing to compromise on both ends. You, nothing's going to be perfect. Nothing's ever going to be perfect, but you do the best you can. Um, why is it that nutrition classes are not prioritized in medical school? Um, you do get some of it, um, and you'll get some of that throughout your training, actually, in seeing patients in rotations and in residency as well. Um, and you will, you will get some of those classes at some extent. Why is it not prioritized? There's just so much in medicine. You can't know everything. You can't learn everything. And, you know, you have to have a basic understanding of the, the main health issues like heart attack, strokes, diabetes, hypertension, surgery, obstetrics, pediatrics. Uh, you have to know all that stuff. So you can't know everything. Um, so, you know, it's a shame. It's a shame. We can't, we don't know everything, but you know, you do what you can. Um, Income level better explains the disparities in quality of care than race. Both are important, both impact it. And it's, it depends on the community. Every community is different. So in one community, income may play a bigger role, but in another area of the country, race may play, play a bigger role. It's, it's multifactorial. It's never that simple. Um, Dr. Hall is a person of color. What struggles do you face becoming a doctor? Um, I wouldn't say that there's anything that really sticks out. Um, I would say, you know, there's a lot of, I think there is a lot of discrimination against people of Asian, um, South Asian background in medicine. Um, I would say the average Asian student has a higher GPA and higher MCAT score and, you know, board scores than, you know, other races. And, you know, there's, there's, there is a, um, a level of discrimination there that, you know, we need to take more underserved areas. And it's always the same as, you know, when you were applying to high school and getting into college, right? There's, you have to balance out, you know, um, you know, discrimination versus reverse discrimination, things like that. So I wouldn't say there's anything major, you know, that I've experienced personally. Um, let's see. Certain races are disproportionately impoverished, impover, impoverished. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look at Native Americans, right? I mean, they're by far have the worst mortality rates and obesity rates and lower education rates than any other race in the country by far. I mean, exponentially. I mean, that's 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 very well established and known. Um, when was it that you realized your interest for medicine? Um, I personally grew up with a lot of family members, including my parents, um, as physicians and extended family members on both sides of the family in the U.S. and in other countries as well. So it was kind of all I ever knew. So it's kind of been something I've always been interested in personally. Um, lots of discussion here. That's really good. I'm hoping it doesn't get too hostile for all of you guys. Um, what do you believe is the key to balancing a career in medicine and life? always working on that working on that right now it's um it's tough you have to find something you know this is one of the things that i experienced as a new attending physician of training you know in med school and in residency you're always studying there's always another test there's always another rotation every month is something different there's always something next with you know achieve um graduating this and getting to that and graduating that and suddenly you're an attending and you're done you never take a test ever again in your life and you're like I remember myself, I was sitting there thinking like, oh my God, I'm going to spend the next three to four decades of my life sitting in this clinic, seeing patients day in and day out. I kind of had this little crisis moment. I'm like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? I have to, I need some hobbies. I need some hobbies again. I need to find something besides, you know, studying and work that, you know, can fulfill me. So still figuring that out. It's hard, um, but it's a problem for a lot of people. Um, I heard... I've heard that a lot of books teach symptom recognition on white skin as a default. So doctors aren't being properly trained to recognize external things on all skin colors. I would say generally, yes. Um, and that's changing a lot, um, but yes, especially in dermatology. And I think you guys have had dermatology lectures, but I know we, I've got some of those lectures from dermatologists in the past. It's like, that's always a big thing is how do you recognize, you know, a rash on, you know, a black, person versus a white person or an Asian person, it's it get hard sometimes. And so, yeah, we're not always taught about that. That's, that's a good, that's a good comment. Um, I 
I wouldn't say it's baseline genetics that's causing a you know problem with mortality rates in labor. I would say it's you know it's probably more things along the lines of social determinants of health, of community resources, and access to healthcare, and access to prenatal counseling, um, um, pregnancy counseling, OBs, et cetera. It's probably more a lot of that and diet and, and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I don't have COVID. I'm just talking a lot. Um, do you think the new COVID vaccine will be equally distributed to impoverished areas considering? No, it absolutely will not. Um, yeah, exactly. Cause it has to be stored in transport at such a low specific low temperature. Okay. That whole Pfizer thing. Yes, it is very promising. Absolutely. Um, but it's very preliminary data. Uh, there's a long way to go on that. And how many rural, um, you know, counties and places in the country have a refrigerator freezer that can store things in the vaccine at negative 94 degrees, probably not a lot, um, you know, and who's going to get it. And if that, that, yeah, I mean, it's promising, but yeah, I don't, I don't know that we're going to, we're a long way away from having enough months away from having enough vaccines to actually distribute, let alone distribute to the people who actually need it. We haven't seen from the Pfizer um, study the population that showed the vast, you know, the huge benefit, the over 90% efficacy rate, you know, was that in 30 year olds or 15 year olds or 10 year olds or 70 year olds? I and mean, people that need it the most are our elderly population. And we have no idea if that Pfizer study showed efficacy in that age group. So long, long, long way to go. And we, you know, we could all get COVID by the time the vaccines actually distributed in any meaningful, meaningful amount, in which, which case, is it actually going to do anything at that point? Who knows? Um, good question. Um, how do we get this PowerPoint? This is on their live stream, so you'll see it later. Um, it'll be there after the live stream. And you can pause it as you need to and go back and et cetera and things like this. This is why I want to become an MD, PhD. Um, yeah, it's cool. I mean, there's people that have to be interested in this type of stuff. Not just that you're safe, but have to be able to stay interested in it long enough through their career to actually do something about it later. You get so bogged down with the process of, you know, seven to 15 years of medical training that, you know, are, do you care about it long enough to actually be in a position to do something about it? Yeah, it's all like, well, to be passionate about this when you're 19, no offense, but, you know, when you actually become 40, 45, 50, or, even older when you're at the point of a position where you can actually have a voice enough to make an impact, are you going to care about that 30 years from now? You may not. Um, so that, that's, that's a tough one. Um, I think it comes down to doctors not believing that people of color are in pain. That's absolutely not true. Um, I don't, I think that's generalizing um, way too much. Um, what do you think are qualities that make the best doctors? Um, I mean, the stuff thing, right? You have to be, you have to be some level of emotional intelligence. You have to be able to connect with your patients. I mean, you can be the smartest person in the world and get A's on every test and hundred percent on everything. But if you can't connect with your patients and talk to someone, what does that matter? Right. Um, someone comes into you, um, into the ER uh, with their husband and then the patient dies, um, you know, and or their spouse is sitting there next to you and they're crying their eyes out and then, you know, do, do they care that you got a hundred percent on your anatomy test, you know, 10, 15 years ago? No, no one cares about that. That doesn't mean anything. Um, your ability to connect with patients, you know, no matter what specialty you're in is, is, is I think a very critical factor. Did you always want to specialize in pelvic medicine? No, I actually wanted to do ER for a really long time. Um, let's see. What is the percentage of your time that you spend with patients doing admin work? I pretty much do no admin work right now because I'm fresh out of training and kind of at the bottom of the totem pole once again. So um, none right now, no admin work. Um, these questions are good. I'm trying to keep track of all the questions. Yeah, there's a lot of them. Um, do For family medicine, do you go into more in depth into nutrition? I think as family medicine, you get more than most specialties. I, mean, I don't think we get a ton. Um, I think, you know, in the nature of ideally you're continuing to learn and, you know, read up on things. And if you have a huge population in your training or in your job that are, you know, uh, cardiac patients or diabetic patients or uh, kid, you know, nephrology patients, and you'll end up learning more about, you know, the nutritional aspects, that portion of the disease process 
that's most relevant to what you're experiencing in your patient population. <coughs> uh, we're running out of time. I wish I could answer all of these. Uh, I don't think I'm going to get to everything. Um, if you could get, if you could give one piece of piece of advice to individuals preparing for the application process, what would it be? Um, be yourself. Just be yourself. Um, oh, here's an example. Before we finish. Um, this is a lot, I know it's a heavy slide, but let me just read this. It's just, I'm not gonna go into details and explain this case. It's just an idea of, you know, this is an ex something you're gonna experience every day. 60 year old white male with past medical history of hypertension and insulin dependent diabetes comes in for a follow-up a few months later than previously scheduled after being discharged from the ER yesterday. He recently lost his house due to a wildfire. I put that in Southern California. And because his diabetes has been so out of control that he hasn't been feeling well and couldn't do his job, leading to him being recently fired. He hasn't been able to take his insulin as he is supposed to. He hasn't been able to afford any new shoes and has some sores on his feet. He is currently residing in a homeless shelter. He had to sell his car and the nearest bus station is two miles away. That would give him access to the hospital. Uh, he was found unconscious in his bed at the shelter yesterday and was sent to the ER where his blood sugar was over 400. He was treated in the ER and discharged. He feels better today and now he's following up with you. That's a, that's a really heavy case, but that happens every day. That happens all the time. And so I mentioned before, um, you know, one of the other slides, you know, is it our job? Um, yes and no, right? I mean, I have my agenda. The patient has, has his agenda. I mean, you look at that and What's his priority? He's feeling fine right now, right? He treated the ER yesterday. He's like, I feel fine. I'm good. I'm fine. I'm good. You know, uh, you know, what, what are you worried about? Why are you, why are you going to talk to me about my insulin? I don't have an income. I don't have a house. I don't have um, shoes right now. I don't have transportation. Things are hard. Um, and I think a lot of physicians in general, I think our default because of how our, 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 the way our training was, is I think we just default to, I just need to focus on getting your diabetes under control. And, you know, in our head, it's like, your diet, your blood sugar was 400. You ended up in the ER. How can that not be your priority, right? That's what we're trained to do. We know diabetes. We know high hypertension. We know heart failure. We know that stuff. Uh, we have tools to treat those things and to, and to make those things better. Um, I can't help this guy with the other stuff. So I think in general, we tend to, again, default to tuning that all out. All right. I'm sorry. That's, that's awful. And I know that's difficult. And in my head, I know that that's contributing to him getting his high blood pressure and diabetes under control, but I'm just going to focus on, okay, well, let's get to the medication we need, but I can't prescribe him insulin. He doesn't have a fridge where you can store it, right? That That's not going to work. Um, that's just an example of, you know, a situation that you will experience over and over and over again, over again for the rest of your medical career, no matter what specialty you're in. Um, here's another map. Um, I think I know we're, we're over time, but let me see in the chat. What do you guys think this map is representing or representative of? Have you worked with naturopathic doctors and managing patients' illnesses on a team before? Yeah, in residency, I got the chance to do a little bit of that. Um, plastic surgery is the best so far. Ouch, bro. Um, if race is an issue, there should be disparity between white and colored communities, quality effectiveness of care with both groups having the same average income level. Yeah, that's a little, to a point. Um, yeah, let's see, what else do you guys think? Let me see some more comments on the chat of what you think that this, this map is representative of. Yeah, absolutely. It's like, like Emily said, it's, it's, it's good to have these levels of conversation. You know, we all need more education on this stuff and none of us knows all the data for everything. Um, it's, it's, you know, we don't, none of us know. So it's good to have conversation. We can't, we can't get each other down. We can't start getting mad at each other and be mean to each other. We're all here to learn and, you know, make our community healthier. Homelessness, diabetes rates. What else? Anyone else? There's 674 of you on right now. Um, so we've got to have more than a handful of people commenting on what they think this map is showing. Homelessness, access to healthcare, obesity, diabetes, all good guesses. This is actually one that just, this is a very recent one came out within the last couple of months. This is actually the areas of the country that are most um, at risk and having problems with COVID actually. So again, similar to the that, that slide I had earlier with the um, 
uh, the unemployment rates and heart disease. It seems to be the southern half of the country that's dealing with, um, in general, more at risk for COVID and you know other things. Um, food desert skin, yeah, <laughs> that's a, definitely a problem um, in a lot of places. But I mean, that's that's a pretty impactful. Um, that's a pretty impactful map. You're like, what's going on in the southern half of the country that people are being so much more affected by COVID than any other places? Yeah. Don't really have a good answer for that. I don't know. Uh, we're still trying to figure that out, but some food for thought, huh? Anyway, questions, comments. I know we've done a lot of them already. Um, thanks, everyone. Uh, I know that was a that was a lot, and I, we had a, a ton of conversation and discussion on there. Um, glad you all were were um, participating. Thank you to our hosts. Um, reach out if you guys have any questions, concerns. I'll do my best. I get a lot of comments. Um, I'll try my best to answer as many things as I can. Thanks again. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Mittal. This was a great, great presentation and such an important one that, you know, we haven't really gotten as much of a chance to see during our presentation so far. So thank you so much again. Um, additionally, thank you all for attending today. Um, the link to the Google form has been posted in the chat box. So if you could please fill that out within the next 30 minutes, it'll be open until 6.37 p.m. Eastern. And once again, thank you so much, Dr. Mittal. This was, this was wonderful. Thank we you love again having for having me. On. Thank you again for having me. I have a couple more sessions I'm going to do um, in February. That's Great. the next one I could get. So I'll see you guys again then. Great. We look forward to it. Thank you.